Welcome and uh, thank you for joining us for the last Lightning Talks today. I'm Zee Fischer. Zeltafiel is not here any longer, but she still did most of the organization. Um, the Lightning Talks will also be streamed and recorded. So as a note for all speakers, you'll be live on television. Mm. For the audience, if you have questions, please step up to the microphones to ask them if there is any time. We have this nice uh, clock here, which shows the five minutes which are allotted for each lightning talk. The first three minutes, it's green, then it turns yellow, and for the last 30 seconds, it turns red. And so you can see if there's still some time left. The speakers can also see this. Yeah, for the speakers, uh, if it's your turn to speak, uh, please come back uh, behind the stage and uh, just switch quickly with the next speaker. Uh, please tell me to advance your slides. I have your slides here on the computer, and I can advance them for you. Yeah, and I think then we'll start. And we're going to start with uh, Tom, who's going to be talking about uh, who's going to be talking about repairing Apple chargers. Hello, Tom. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, yeah. Next slide, please, since we have only five minutes. So um, there is a well-known Apple charger problem uh, that's going on for years, mostly with the, uh, with the older um, uh, Apple chargers from the, from the first generation. And uh, there's actually a, a pretty simple formula for that one. It's just you take the, uh, the lousy cable quality, which is the, the, uh, the worst thing, uh, and uh, plus a wrong tie-up, which is also suggested by Apple themselves. And you take those two, you add them up, and um, you do that times the uh, some time, and then eventually it would it will look like uh, like you can see on the screen. So that is a well-known problem. Um, so next slide. So uh, and then there is also the the charger solution problem. So how can you open a charger in a non-destructive way? Uh, as you can see on this picture, this is a picture from uh, from iFixit, and they they use a screwdriver to pry it open. Uh, as you can imagine, afterwards it it looks like crap. Uh, you should also know that a new charger costs about 70 euros, so it's it's quite expensive to that you always need to buy a uh, a new charger. So uh, next slide, you can see another way to open it, and over here this side suggests it. Just take a pair of pliers, put it in between, and and try to try to force a break, but that's not easy because most humans don't have a third hand to, to hold the thing while you try uh, to, uh, to open it in this, uh, in this way. So uh, yeah, there has to be another way. Next slide. So uh, that's why I uh, made up the, uh, the apple cracker and it, uh, it looks like this. And it's a, uh, it's actually a small jig, and uh, I have someone from our hackerspace, Quinton, and he will uh, walk around uh, so you can so you can see it in detail. Um, so it's actually a small device that you can use to uh, to open the um, the device. So next slide, then I'll guide you to the quickly to the process. First, you cut off the wire. Yes. Next, then you put it in the cracker. As you can see on the picture, it it has uh, it has some cutouts on the back. Um, and these cutouts, they, they fit precisely into, uh, uh, into the edges. So that, that there's enough place for the falls. And then the, the next slide, please. Then you turn the bolts with a, with a wrench and, and this way. Next, please. You see that it slowly comes open and then the first, the, the, the plastic clips, they come off. And then next, up. And then it comes more, more force open. Next, next. So then you can open it by hand, next. Uh, then you cut off this piece and you need to clean it out on the next slide, um, next. And then you put the cable through, next. And then uh, this is the distance that you need, next. Uh, then you prepare the heat shrink, as you can see on picture one and picture two, next. Uh, and then you clean up the circuit board by, by pulling out the, the rest of the wires while heating it with a soldering iron, next please. Uh, then you resolder the wires on the circuit board. Next, please. Uh, it's almost done, you see. So now the, you put uh, the little plastic thingy back and you, you take a tie wrap and you put it behind to pull it on the cables as a sort of a, um, 
um, force. Yeah, that's just a small protection. Next, uh, you put it back together and uh, you can glue it back up with PVC glue, for example. Next, please. And then you add some clamps for a while so that the plastic can dry. And then in the next step, it will be finished. Hopla. So, uh, I believe this is the last slide. Yeah. So, thank you. I have about 20 charges up to now that I, that I repaired uh, the, the past year. So, uh, if you do have an Apple charger with you, with the problem, and you want to repair it for yourself, but you want to pry it open in a, in a, in a proper way, then just come by the, uh, the hardware hacking area, which is also the Belgian village. Um, I'll be there from, uh, from after these lightning talks, and uh, we can, uh, I can help you open it. So, and then you can do the repair yourself. So, any questions? Thank you. Next up is Vera Wild talking about the dark web. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Vera Caitlin Wild, and it's my privilege to be here with you today at Chaos Communication Camp 2015. Uh, thank you for sharing these woods and times with me. I'm here to propose uh, two interventions to resolve the paradox of discretionary power in the age of mass surveillance. The paradox is that we know all, all sorts of reasons why centralized discretionary power can be dangerous. Um, hmm. But we also know that decentralized information systems produce the most efficient aggregate outcomes. This is why markets work, it's why democracies work, and it's also why the internet needs to remain free. The two interventions have to do with rebranding the dark web and distributing art and information security kits around the world. The rebranding of the dark web that I want to propose is that we call it instead the EDER or other web which is an acronym for express, dissent, teach, resist. These are the things that people are free to do on the artist formerly known as the dark web. Um, by express, I mean things like uh, people who have non-majority sexual orientations are able to express themselves there. They're also able to dissent, for example, in places like Iran where being homosexual is punishable by death. They're able to teach, uh, for example, Christianity in areas that are perhaps Islamic state controlled where uh, that would be, again, illegal and punishable by death, potentially. And they're also able to resist. So a lot of people know that Internet activists use the Internet, for example, as part of the Arab Spring, to fight uh, brutally repressive regimes. What they may not know is that the governments then figured out that they could use the same tools to track down and kill those activists. And that's something that, for example, the Assad regime did in Syria, and it was very important for the same activists to then have alternate networks to go to, to have an other or other web space to work on, to continue working for freedom. So intervention one is that we just stop doing other people's PR for them by calling it the dark web and instead call it the other or other web. Intervention two is that we create what the fuck butterfly kits or art and information security kits. Uh, what the fuck butterfly is a, a term referring to the way that the butterfly or the symbol of chaos, which is modeled in formal game theoretical terms as a butterfly, a Lorenz system, uh, is able to shape global security in the way that narrative shapes material conditions. So the same conditions with a different story um, can, in, in essence, narrative can turn a mistrust spiral into a trust spiral. So examples of what the fuck butterflies throughout history are people like Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr. or Rosa Parks, who through nonviolent resistance have used the power of story to change material realities in powerful ways. And we want to support proper information security uh, by distributing uh, tools like the CIJ Handbook, uh, Handbook for Information Security for Journalists, which is on the CIJ website. Uh, distributing that and other information security tools like Tor and PGP encrypting on a USB drive, uh, along with free books, uh, for example, a Library of Liberty, um, Shakespeare, the Bible, the Quran, just 
truth and beauty on a USB drive along with some tools for making art to support what the fuck butterflies around the world doing their work, um, helping make the world feel safe to flourish through art and information. If you want to get in touch and talk about these ideas, um, please contact me after the talk. My email address is wild as in Oscar and thinks as in thinking at gmail.com. Thanks. Thanks. Next up is Nikto talking about decentralized package signing. Thanks. So uh, I would like to share a few thoughts about uh, how the package signing works nowadays uh, in uh, Linux distributions or in some other distributions. What's wrong and what can be improved? Uh, slide, please. Okay, so uh, nowadays uh, you have typically uh, some distribution, I don't know, Debian, CentOS, or something like that, or even Red Hat, or <laughs> things like that. And uh, you have some central server uh, that's signing the packages. As a client, you have imported the key uh, of the server, public key, and you can verify uh, each package if the uh, signature is valid. And yeah, you download the packages from some mirror, and uh, yeah, for each package you verify the signature. This is okay. Let's uh, go next. Um, yeah, the problem is that if you have a really strong attacker, like uh, some intelligent agency or something like that, some I don't know NSA or Chinese or Russians or whatever you like, <laughs> you can choose. Uh, then. Uh, they may be able to somehow uh, compromise the server signing the packages. Uh, or it can be a technical way, uh, you just hack it or have uh, some special exploit that no one knows about or things like that. Or you can use a human factor. Uh, it's rare to have a people that have uh, uh, funds and uh, time to do things uh, voluntarily, so you can just uh, insert your own people there or you can have a physical access somewhere, or you can use some legislation, like some countries have very bad legislation, you just came somewhere, tell them like, hey, give us your keys or you will go to jail, and you cannot tell anyone about this. So, yeah, let's assume that uh, there is a attacker strong enough to do these things. Uh, they typically also have access to uh, uh, certificate authorities, which are not really authorities, so they can do uh, Mend the middle attacks on the SSL or men at the side. Uh, slide, please. Uh, okay, so how the attack uh, look like? Uh, maybe slide, uh, it's like that, okay. So you have a client, you want to update your system, you click on update, you download the packages from some mirror or somewhere else. Uh, the attacker, uh, as we know from the Snowden leaks at least, uh, have some server near the backbone. So he can respond faster than the original server. Uh, they can break SSL in some ways, they have keys or so, uh, or even the SSL is not used. And if they have a, a key for signing the packages, they just send you fake package faster. Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, what can we do uh, to prevent this? Uh, one solution would be not to have a single server that's signing the packages, but to have a multiple server and use some uh, multi-sign scheme, like, uh, for example, in Bitcoin, it's uh, used quite uh, commonly. So you would need, I don't know, five from seven servers or two from three, or just pick your constants. And you can, pick, uh, you can put these servers all around the world, so you at least can prevent legislation attacks. Like, you can force someone in US to give you the keys, but the same attacker won't be able to do that in, I don't know, Russia or China. And vice versa, the Chinese can force their server to give them a keys, but not, not the US guys. So the idea behind this is that uh, we are not strong enough to fight a very motivated agency or something like that, but uh, we can let them fight each other. So, yeah, and they are built for exactly this, so they know how to prevent others from getting the things, and so. Uh, next slide, please. So, yeah, uh, instead of having one single server, you just, you just go all around for signing each package. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, yeah, it would be slightly slower, but just minimally. Like uh, when you compare it to shell things that are happening when you are updating system, it's it's completely nothing. Uh, it's a little bit complicated to implement, but once you do it, it should it should just work. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So if you have some questions or yeah, nothing. Okay. No questions. Yeah. Thank you. Next up is Victor Nomad talking about protocoder. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, prepared for, for this. So, hello everybody. I'm gonna present a bit of, uh, of a project I've been working for two years already. It's an uh, open source framework for Android, but it's a bit different than the normal things. Uh, next slide, please. So um, I guess many of you try to do things with uh, Android. Um, basically, if you, if you haven't done anything, basically the way of starting to do things with Android is like this. It's like, um, let's start uh, with a normal tutorial. Next slide. So the, the f I cannot read the screen. <laughs> uh, so the first thing is like you have to download uh, is Android Studio. Yeah, Android Studio. Next slide. Then you have to uh, download Java. Next slide. Um, then uh, you have to download the SDK. Next, sli next slide. Um, I'm a bit blind. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Then basically you have to gr grab the, like, basically the source code that they provide you in the tutorial. Next slide. And then you have to, you know, grab the XML for the layout. Next uh, slide. And then uh, basically you have to press play or compile. Next slide. And then you have to wait, next slide, and then you have to wait more, and at the end you get a uh, software. But, next slide, um, I think you went one further. Yeah, the previous? Uh, yeah, so I think it's like, it's a bit old fashioned this way of working, and I think we can do things a bit better. Like, we are, we are in 2015, so we can do things in a different way. Next slide. So I created Protocoder, next slide, which basically is like just an app that you install, install in your phone, and the app has absolutely everything you need. And then basically it has a kind of micro cloud, it has a bunch of servers that you can access through your uh, web browser, and then you get a full um, web IDE that it doesn't go through internet or anything, it's like basically you store it in your phone, and you can write any code. Next slide. Um, I give you an example here, please. Uh, an example of how you write code in Android, so uh, with Protocoder. So it's basically JavaScript, it's really simplified everything. You don't have to uh, write this like really verbose code that usually you have in, in Java. And just to let you know how it works, I just added two more lines to that, that thing, uh, and you can do... So it's basically... For me, this is the hello world of Android using protocoder. It's like four lines of code and you have something like this. Next slide. Uh, this is how it looks, uh, or it used to look, uh, because now I'm, I'm, it's a bit different. But you have an app uh, where you have all your projects, examples, and in the other side you have the web editor. Next slide. It comes with a lot of libraries already, so you can do like network operations, you, can, you have web sockets, HTTP request, uh, you have OSC, open sound control, if you don't know it. Uh, MIDI support, you can plug an Arduino to your Android phone, uh, and with two lines of code, you are starting to communicate with it, which is really awesome. You have Bluetooth, Bluetooth, Bluetooth 4 support. Um, you have Pure Data, I don't know if you know Pure Data, but it's a really awesome uh, uh, sound engine. You have Processing, it's a fork version of Processing, the, which is this visual language. Next slide, please. Um, uh, just to let you know, is uh, protocoler is open source. It is with it works with, with JavaScript, but it doesn't work in a web view. Basically, it's like it runs with Java, but it has a virtual um, interpreter, which is a Mozilla Rhino. Um, uh, it doesn't use cloud. I don't like clouds because basically you kind of you um, give your data to another people, and then I prefer to have this kind of micro cloud here with you. You can code with. USB with Wi-Fi, you can code from a computer or from the device itself. Um, yeah, next. And if you wanna 
check it out. You have the website. You have the rep repository with all the source code. Um, I'm looking for people who want to go with me in this adventure. And if you want to have a chat, you can contact me or have a chat after this. Thank you. We still might have time for a question, if there is one. Any questions? No? Great. Then, thank you very much. Next up is Becher talking about his Wild Village ad adventure. Hi, my name is Vesna. This is my ninth large hackers camping conference since 97 in Holland. I only missed one of the German CCC camps. And one of the things that I like the most uh, is the lakes or the forests that were around the camp. So then I thought, well, why don't I organize my next hackers conference myself? Next slide, please. So I'm here to invite you to my village in Croatia and uh, to, to come and have an adventure there. Next slide, please. So it's going to happen next year. It's kind of strategically positioned between the CCC camp and the Dutch camp, which is going to be in 2017. And it's part of the larger story uh, my long-term goal is to create the intentional community of hackers and the people who like nature that would like to move away from the cities but still uh, uh, keep the spirit of urban exploration and finding alternative solutions. And so this is going to be one of the small first steps to, to get there. So um, the... The village is in the mountains, it's in the middle of nowhere, and I want to spend two or three weeks there, so the plans are not really uh, solidified yet. And what's going to happen there? Well, everything from just being there, to the unconference, to building a sauna, to any project that you introduce, or having the wireless mesh network. Next slide, please. Uh, this is how it looks like. So we've been there last year to see basically what is there, and it's really wonderful, although it actually needs quite some work. Next slide, please. So if you join, you can camp there for free, and there is actually um, an old farmhouse and the other one from the neighbor, and there are stables and kind of old workshops like actually very much like here on this place. So with a heavy wooden table with, with wrenches and like old fashioned tools and so on. And in one of the houses, there is actually a kitchen and a bathroom and there's electricity and all kinds of facilities, but not everybody can actually stay in that house. So we will have to camp. Next slide, please. So this is how it looked like when we were there. It was already a small family reunion gathering with like 15 toothbrushes together in the bathroom. Next slide, please. And so what can we do? Well, we can have an unconference where people teach each other things. We can collect wild food and uh, the herbs, the healing herbs. I'm a bit of an uh, amateur expert in that and uh, I can teach people about it. And then there are all kinds of self-sufficiency things that we can practice while we are there. And also enjoying nature by itself. So walking around, meditating, doing yoga, it's it all depends on what kind of group of people goes there. Next slide, please. So this is... Uh, um, an image of what can you expect. There is wonderful water there, mushrooms, uh, strawberries. Next slide, please. And this is where it's located. So it is in Europe, but uh, just barely. So can you, uh, yeah. And uh, these are other activities. So uh, they, they're kind of close to the birthplace of Nikola Tesla, but the electrical installations there are a, a little bit old fashioned uh, by now. Next slide, please. And uh, these are the contact details. And uh, I will leave you with the last slide, if you uh, just move on to uh, the picture of cuddly squirrels, uh, because that's the most motivational thing that, uh, that there is on the internet. And uh, if you have any questions, there is still some time.
already out. Slides are already out. Thank you there, very much. There's yeah. one more question, I think. Okay. How big of an uh, audience do you anticipate uh, for this conference? 20, 30, 50 people. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Next up is a talk about the faces of hackers. Hi. 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 Oh, it gets cut a little bit. Hi, all. my name is Matteo. Since 2005, I've been taking pictures of hackers all around the, uh, the European uh, um, events. You may have seen me in uh, in the last uh, camps, because I had this huge light with all the bulbs in it. Uh, maybe I've taken a picture of a picture of you. I'm presenting a, a project that will be a Roman exposition. The name is Lombrosity. Next slide, please. Uh, Cesare Lombroso was Lombroso was a criminologist of the 18th century. He theorized that the, that could be something like a born hacker. Uh, sorry, a born criminal. <laughs> Pun intended. And, and you could spot out different type of criminals by imperfections and by biometrical, uh, bi biometrical traits. So you could have the eyes of the murderer, the ear of the thief, the nose of the swindler. I know that sounds crazy. It has been used in 18th century over and over to find out criminal and supposed criminals. Next slide, please. So, in 1887, uh, 89, he published uh, a book. The name was The Man of Genius, in which he, he theorized something that is even more weird. Genius was a type of insanity, and it could be passed to your children. And he did this very uh, extended uh, research on type of faces of geniuses from his time. So, next slide, please. I'm at and I've been shooting hackers with a camera, only with a camera, since 2005 to find out if there is some sort of common trait in the faces uh, of hackers from all around the world. Fun fact is, aside from being generally awesome, and, the fact, and aside from a general diversity and beautiful diversity, there seems to be obviously no common traits. So every single time you depict a hacker in a certain way, with a certain hair, with a certain uh, uh, type of physiognomy, you're doing something like stereotypes and that's all. Aside from being a little bit more males than female, in, in, in the year, but that is changing, fortunately, since 2005. Even the portraits that I've got uh, in the different events are more female-friendly than the, than the first ones, and that is good. You, you have no common traits. Next slide, please. Oh, that's me. <laughs> Another one, please. So, how extensive is the collection? Almost 8,000 pictures of 13 events. Uh, more than 8,000 kilometers travel to take them. And I've got, well, right now it's, the, the figure is close to 600 different faces. I think I've got the second largest collection in the world of portraits of Hacker. The first one is supposedly in the NSA, but I can... Mm, <laughs> I, I can trust it. <laughs> Next slide, please. You see, there is some common trait in the faces of hackers. Look at the eyes. You're, you're very bad persons, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, the eyes, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not kidding. You can, as long as you will look at the photos, there's a website, go in the website and look at that, uh, them. You will find out incredibly curious eyes. Uh, the, the, the fact that characterize all the hackers that I've met uh, into these 10 years, is the extreme curiosity, and it reflects uh, even on, on a portrait. Uh, they are, they are, I'm not a good photographer, but they are awesome people. Look at their eyes. Take another picture. Look at this guy. Uh, he, he didn't have sex with a Smurf. It's only a um, colored bird. <laughs> His name is Dante. He's one of the fellow in uh, um, 
Hermes Center, I'm one of the founders myself, go talk to him, he's a quite amazing guy. Next one. Uh, some of them, uh, some of us hackers are beautiful. Here is uh, one example. My one is not so beautiful, so I use that one instead of me because it's far better than I can be. Okay, next one. All photos are released in Creative Commons. Next one. Some other people. Next one again. There will be a roaming exposition. I'm starting in Rome at the Maker Fair, and there will be another one in Expo 2015. Ask me to host it. I can send you a picture. You can choose the picture uh, and uh, present them at your location. I can even do pictures of you. Next one. Uh, the last one is come to get your portraits if you want. I will be at the Italian Embassy with this huge ring light. Uh, and uh, go to the websites, uh, look at the fellow hackers, uh, and uh, just be as you are. I like every kind of faces, and we are collectively awesome, and I think so. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next up is a talk about OWRL. Can you hear me? Oh. No. Can I hide? No, it's okay? Okay. 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 Um, okay. Um, so, uh, my name is Olivier. Uh, I live in uh, San Francisco. Uh, and um, I'm uh, mainly hardware, so that's my first time at the camp. And um, uh, first, I want to say that I'm amazed by the camp and the people I, I've been meeting. I think it's, it's a lot of energy, and uh, it's really great uh, to be here. Uh, so today, I'm here to show you a, a project. So uh, we are doing hardware. Uh, we are doing hardware for customer. And every year, we are trying to do a project uh, uh, that we think is very important. And um, as a hardware person, we wanted to participate to the privacy uh, issue. So we wanted to do a computer which could bring more safety for people to develop software on top of it. Okay, uh, so um, uh, if you go to the next slide, um so we designed this computer, um, which has two keys. And basically, you cannot use a computer unless you have a key with you. So um, this is a, the prototype of the computer, and I can show you that after. So uh, to use the device, you are using a key. If you are um, uh, next to it, so it will not start until the key is presented. If you are next to it in 10 meters, you can work with it. If you are 10 meters away, you log out and uh, you have a, a lock screen and uh, you cannot access it. If when you are log out, somebody moves the device or walk away, we wipe all the, uh, sorry, we shut down. If somebody try to open it, make a hole, or disassemble, or do some side channel selection, or whatever, uh, we will erase all the keys, including the SSD keys and all the credential keys. Um, so, um, next slide. So this is a real computer. Um, there is inside a, a x86 platform, Skylake. Uh, there is an access point, 802.11, uh, and uh, there is um, uh, also a secure uh, microcontroller. We have um, USB output uh, uh, for uh, keyboard and uh, uh, accessories, and we also have an HDMI out to put a, a screen. Next slide. Uh, this is what is inside. Um, so, so this is really um, uh, an x86 platform, and I can show you that after, uh, which is fully secure under a shell with a dynamic mesh, uh, and I can also explain the details uh, later. Uh, so the device um, uh, will erase all the SSD, uh, 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 sorry, sorry, SSD keys and um, any credential keys if it's tampered uh, or frozen or uh, uh, trying to be uh, to be opened. Um, next slide. Uh, this is how it's made inside, and I can show that to you. Uh, so it's really an x86 platform with two, four, eight gig, uh, and there is on the back an SSD slot where you can put uh, up to 512 gig of, of uh, SSD slot. Uh, the key is uh, encrypted with NFC on Bluetooth, and um, I can also explain how this is done. Uh, next slide. Um, that's the basic architecture, so I just want to highlight this is three components. There is an access point, there is a secure controller, and there is a full computer. 
uh, and the goal is really to be able to make sure that you can trust the computer. Um, we designed that mainly for um, ONG, journalists. Um, we want uh, to bring any kind of uh, se hardware security to people to put any kind of software they want on top of it. So our goal is to do that open source on open hardware and let people uh, do whatever they want. And uh, I've been talking with a lot of people with different ideas and uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to hear more from everyone. Um, so we are trying to find some key project to support. We will open all the different uh, uh, technical documentation to enable people to do uh, development on this. So if you have any good idea or something that you want to develop, uh, please come see me and um, I can give you uh, more details. Uh, next slide. Uh, that's uh, where you can contact me. Uh, and uh, we've put uh, some basic um, uh, the, uh, specification on the website. Um, we are currently in prototype phase, uh, so we don't have that many units. And we are trying to go to the next stage uh, to try to focus our activity on this and try to participate to uh, any privacy uh, uh, improvement. Uh, we think we can help in the hardware. Uh, I cannot do much in software at all, but in hardware, I think we've done uh, an interesting job here. So that's it. So I will be here, and I'm also at the French Embassy uh, if you have any questions. Yeah, there's a question. Hi, thank you for your presentation. Uh, did you get in contact with uh, another project that is working on open design hardware called CryptTech? Um, no, I'm, I'm interested to know. Uh, it's cryptech.is. Okay. We can talk later. Thank you. That will be great. I'm very new to the community, so um, I've tried to meet a lot of people and try to understand. But uh, please, uh, uh, I would love to learn more on other projects. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next up is someone who we've already seen yesterday. That is uh, Steve899 talking about peak level performance. <clears throat> Thank you very, very much. Uh, my name is uh, Michael, and yesterday I was on this stage, actually. And after this talk, I have another slot, so bear with me a few more moments. This is my nature. I love to be in the spotlight, and the CCC is for me a great learning experience. I learn a lot and I just realized that mind is a very plastic matter. And just as we send uh, space shuttles to outer space, we are able to observe galaxies million light years uh, uh, behind. However, we haven't built a microscope into our brain. We know relatively little about how our brain works on the intermolecular level. We know about, say, dopamine, some neurotransmitters, but there has been a very, well, not to my knowledge, there is no microscope into the brain. And I know that mm, certain, uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh. Mm. Basically, a uh, human brain is very plastic. Uh, we have enormous capability to improve our performance. And as I was uh, experiencing this camp, I realized that I should improve the quality of my breathing, that my lungs should absorb more oxygen. I should improve the quality of my running. If I run quickly, I can able to do more stuff and also learning, absorbing the knowledge and communication protocols because we are from different cultures, from different backgrounds. We come from different uh, places and th this, this is the place. If we, if we learn uh, how to communicate between each other, this will, can be a major shift. For instance, next slide. For, for instance, uh, we don't talk about uh, sex, uh, drugs and money at school. I wish my children were taught how to talk about sex, drugs, and money. This is nothing evil. This is part of everyone's lifestyle. Well, basically, we need to improve our communication. And the, the project I was talking yesterday, the Genesis RE, uh, it, 
it is a, a long-term mission, and I would uh, like to uh, look after my body and uh, achieve 150 years of lifespan. I'm pretty sure it is possible. Uh, just looking at the technology progression in the past uh, decade, like the first iPhone was released like 10, 10 years ago, and uh, we put man to the moon in the 60s. So basically, with the medical progress, I'm pretty sure that... Uh, 150 is a very conservative uh, estimate. By the time I'm 60, that it will probably expand to 200. But you know, th this is just a wild guess. And uh, just like the mm, another mission of Genesis, th th this is a very, very long-term vision, is the survival of the human species, because we as a planet Earth, we are, we are a little bit in danger because of the global warming, because of the... What happens if the meteorite hits us? Basically, if we, if we as a humanity want to survive longer term, and I mean longer terms on a cosmic scale, such as billion of years, not like last 200,000, we need to spread out. And the, one of the reasons of the genesis is actually to put systems in place that will allow us to live after we, we spread out. I know, I know this sounds completely crazy. I know that I look like nuts to you. I'm, I'm very well aware of that. However, I am able to connect the energy from the cosmos and at the same time stay grounded. And this, if this is not a place, there is no other place on Earth I could uh, freely speak what I really think. Uh, next slide. I'm actually not asking for not asking for anything. I have all the resources I have. I am actually speaking with with my mother who is uh, supporting me, and basically it's about the journey. Once upon a time, I I achieved the, a goal, and after achieving this goal, I became depressed because there was nothing else to go. This time, my mission is the survival of the human species, and even if I'm say 80% completed. It is still a fairly good goal, and there will, there will be perpetuating. Visit the website genesis.re. Genesis as in source, origin, beginning, .re as in restart, renew. Press the reset button and start something new. Thanks. Thank you very much. Next up is a yoga presentation also being held by it, Michael, was it, right? <laughs> Michael. Okay. Please get your microphone as close as possible. The okay. Best, the be, this, take, take, take your thumb, take your, okay. stick your thumb up this way. Mm -hmm. That's the right distance. All right. I do some yoga, and within the next five minutes, I would like to show you and teach you a very basic sequence. It's called the sun salutation. And whenever you go to a yoga studio, this is the opening sequence because this is just a warm up. And regardless your physical level, you can do this. And I actually encourage you to find some uh, spot and practice with me. If you feel adventurous, if you want to try something new, there is plenty of space in the, in the hallway, plenty of space in the corridor. I encourage you to, to follow me. Uh, right, now I'll just, right now, I'll just put microphone aside just for a few brief moments, and I will demonstrate it to you. And you will see that there is uh, nothing really exceptional. Anyone can do this. As you see, it wasn't anything that special. This is a very basic uh, uh, sequence. And uh, regardless the place where you go, whether it is, because there are so many different types of yoga and one may just uh, pff, like contemplate which one is the, the right for me. 
in, in reality, it doesn't uh, really matter. It is about the journey, it is about the progress. I started doing yoga because I had some uh, back problems. And as I see people at the camp, it's like most of us sit in front of a computer for an extended amount of hours. And in my personal situation, I, it just uh, is helping me. I, I become more efficient, I can, I can work more efficiently. And basically, it, I highly recommend you to, to try out. And probably you've already seen me enough. Can I actually finish earlier? Is there anyone next in line? Maybe any questions from the audience about <laughs> any of the two talks? <clears throat> doesn't look like. Thank you very much. Then thank you thank very much. <laughs> and next up is uh, Al Guldor, if he is here today. He wasn't here yesterday, unfortunately. Al Guldor, are you here to talk about the food hack and base? That would be great. Hmm. Looks like we also don't get to uh, see this presentation today. I could play PowerPoint karaoke with the slides, but I'm going to spare you. <laughs> then maybe Manuel Klarmann is here. Yes, great. He's going to talk about something with climate change. <laughs> something with climate change. Yeah, but a little... Okay. So, hi. Um, my name is Manuel Klamann. Um, next one. Next slide. Next slide. So, um, did you know that 30% of our greenhouse gas emissions originate from our food consumption? Um, this is really massive. Um, everyone... Thank you. Everyone can cook, but do you really know how much CO2 is actually in single ingredients? Um, I got intrigued by the question, how can we break down these complex matters of climate change into simple little steps that everyone can follow? Please, please put your microphone close together. I'm just be, be, give a short, no, no, you can hold it in your hand. It's okay. Or I give it's you... It's fine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, how we can break such a complex problem into little steps that everyone can follow. Um, that's probably also when I, um, why I fall in love with computers when I was uh, really of small age. I fell in love with the idea of creating actually artificial intelligence. And there was actually a vote in my school um, who is going to be the person who will not get along with reality. And I got first place. I scored 70% of all votes. And you got to guess, um, they were right. I not go get along with reality. When I was a small child, I had really the pleasure of a great childhood. We had nothing to worry about. I had enough food, I had enough safety, I could experience and learn everything from the world um, as it came along. I don't know how many people in the world have the chance. So sometimes when I think back, um, back at my childhood, I get struck by the belief that we're actually one huge big family and responsible for each other. And right now, bound by the constraints of nature, here we strive to actually make the decisions for the future generations to come. So there's this thing. When you look at CO2 emissions and food, there's actually the potential to reduce those emissions by 50%. And it's not just about CO2 emissions, it's also equally important about resources like water, oil, land, and so on. And they equally scale down if we reduce CO2 emissions. Um, just to dig in, there's a method, it's called life cycle assessment. Um, where we can look at the specifics, what goes into the processes of food production, what goes out, and from there on, we can see what actually matters um, in terms of CO2 balance. So I, I brought an example. So there's a tomato. When we have it local and it's seasonal, then it's um, really cool. Um, when we bring it from abroad, um, I don't know what it says, if it says Spain or something. It's a little bit more, but when we grow it in a greenhouse, it's much more, this tomato. Which becomes more interesting when we look at asparagus, um, which is also fine if we have local and seasonal, or if we actually <clears throat> bring it in with a ship, which is really low in emissions, but it makes a huge difference if we bring it in by airplane. There you see a huge peak, what actually that difference makes because of the airplane. But most importantly, when you look at uh, animal proteins, you see there are a lot of emissions. Um, 
This is basically from the methane emissions the cow emits and um, that we, we use also to, um, to produce milk. In the middle, there's the cheese. And of course, we grow a lot of feed to actually feed these cows. And that sums up that the, the really big decisions that we should make is actually start loving to eat more plants in order to do something. So this is also... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so this is the easy take-home message. Um, that first, start eating more plants. Second and third, um, more seasonal and local to avoid greenhouses and um, uh, airplanes. But what we thought is that we need to go a step further. So we thought about bringing all this data and, and making uh, climate-friendly meals, really having the convenience that you can go into a restaurant Oh, I'm fucking out of time. <laughs> that you can go into a restaurant and um, actually have a climate-friendly meet at your convenience. So we started a movement. We called ourselves Eternity. We wanted to start a movement to establish climate-friendly meals in society. And so there's the scientific method. This is a carrot. It has 33 grams of CO2. The specialty about it is that we actually collected, we started collecting a few years ago, every scientific publication that actually measures the footprint of different ingredients. We went to the university with this and, and showed it everything, got proof. Actually, right now we're working together with scientists. So we have the ability to do these calculations really precise um, for every meal that basically gets served. There was still, um, this is, this is uh, our database. So there was still a challenge that we needed to convince our university to do actually something about it. So we got a team of people together to um, inform uh, the public. So we finally could make climate-friendly meals in our restaurant. And it was, I mean, it was a lot of work, but it was also a great success. They, the university at first forbid us to actually communicate anything to the public at that moment. But when we served the meals, the media came in from themselves. Um, because they were interested in what we're doing. And out of um, 4,000 meals that were served, 2,000 of those um, were um, eaten climate-friendly and chosen by the students climate-friendly. There was um, a tipping point, because as we did this, Kofi Annan came to visit our university to talk about climate change and how scientists can do something about this and put it into application. And we got the pleasure to actually meet him and tell him about our project, and he basically gave us a pat on our back and said, hey, this is not such something for our university, this is something really for humanity, and we should go out and tell everybody about it. So we took our guts together and we programmed the software that makes it possible that everyone can go on the software and put in recipes and actually see how much CO2 they have. And the third thing that we did is that we um, started going towards restaurants and convincing them to use our software to serve climate-friendly meals. And right now in Switzerland, we have about 100 restaurants that actually do serve climate-friendly meals. So, I'm a little bit over time, sorry. <laughs> um, just to go a step back, it's really easy to cook climate-friendly meals. My grandmother can do it, you can do it. Um, it really connects us to the people that we love. And so, my message to you, if we are able to eat cli climate-friendly uh, climate-friendly three times a week, we could save one billion tons of CO2 a year on this world, and there's nothing like that effective. There's no technical miracle, there's nothing that we can do to actually challenge uh, climate change um, so effective. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up is Remy. Is he there? Yes, he is there. Great. So, Eliza, hello. I'm Remy from The Faced. Uh, I'm going to tell you something about our organization, on our non democratic organization, and we're uh, uh, spread around a lot of countries, so uh, I can speak and uh, Swedish and German and Dutch and English uh, at the same time, so I choose to do it in Dutch. <laughs> uh, and maybe I throw a little Dutch <laughs> and Dutch in it. Uh, the the feest organisatie uh, is eigenlijk een redelijk een redelijke dictatuur. Uh, we uh, spreken geen dingen af. En dat is denk ik waarom de organisatie zo goed werkt. Uh, mensen zeggen wat, iemand kan lid gemaakt worden van de organisatie. 
Je kan niet lid worden. Je kan niet vragen. Je wordt lid gemaakt en je hoort erbij. Dan ben je een member en een crewlid. Een crewlid die uh, mag dus dingen beslissen. Het is alleen niet per definitie dat het uitgevoerd wordt. Want dan heb je medewerking nodig van andere mensen. Uh, sorry. Subtitled. Oh, uh, I don't know if it's possible here. Can somebody subtitle it? I'm not sure whether we have anyone who you speaks may Dutch it. in the translation chamber. No, we don't. Oh. Uh, I'm very sorry. The All people right. in the trend. Then I choose someone from the public. Uh, you in the uh, fourth lane, second spot. You may subtitle it. <laughs> That's how the organization works. <laughs> Uh, we uh, zijn redelijk. Uh, is Nederland. We hebben een aantal policies binnen de organisatie. Een van de dingen is: we hebben een website, we hebben uh, SIP, we hebben uh, IRC. Al die dingen die worden deels zelf gemaakt, deels uh, open source gebruikt. Alles wat zelf gemaakt is, dat mag niet geprogrammeerd worden. Geen, geen regelcode geschreven worden zonder dat je dronken bent. Uh, uh, je, er, er wordt alleen gekookt als er afgewassen is. En ik was niet af. Nou ja. <laughs> Een beetje dat, hoe de organisatie in elkaar zit. En volgens mij uh, is de club uh, ontzettend bekend onder de events. We worden altijd uitgekozen als jullie doen dat, jullie doen dat. Dat is... Onze manier van doen, dus we zijn daar blij mee. Uh, ik denk dat dat wel het belangrijkste was van onze uh, yeah, organization. English word. Please do it in English again. Our questions. Our questions. <laughs> There's a question. Yeah. What? 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 I told What? something about our organization. Ah, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Other questions? There, there is another question over there. It may be the same. Uh, que fait ton, ton organisation, en fait? Elle s'occupe de quoi? Daar zijn wij het wel mee eens, ja. Yeah. Hello. We do agree with that. And, and I think we have time for another question over there. Uh, can you make a lid? What are you? Or can you make a lid? Um, Klinkt goed bij jullie. Het is hartstikke leuk bij ons, maar uh, uh, misschien komen we een keer bij je langs. <laughs> nou ja. Thank you. Sinterkerst. Ja, uh, yeah. als. Yeah. Waar woon je? Want wij organiseren vaak feestjes bij andere mensen thuis. I have a public service announcement from the translation booth. They need help. Oh. <laughs> ja, ik kan wel helpen. Het is geen probleem. Ja, kun je, kun je een keer naar Maastricht komen met jullie, uh, met jullie de feest? Um, Luc Kruipantaar en, en kan het aanraden. Oh, de Lamba Blanc is oh. Ja, dat is mogelijk. Top, do me. Okay, there, there is a rule to the lightning talks. You normally have five minutes, but you can ask for two extension minutes. <laughs> yeah, well, the Dutch translator just came in, so you can listen to the two translated minutes on the... No, okay. It's not the Dutch translator. I must have confused him. <laughs> Well, when you're finished? Yeah, I'm finished. Okay, then thanks very much. That was very informational. <laughs>
please continue, please continue. That's one basic problem of the lighting talks. You can't, normally cannot switch devices and gadgets. That's why we keep it to the end of the talk. So this is the last talk. And so it might be possible. So please be patient for a minute. We are trying to mess up things as fast as we can. And don't use the effort here. So now there might be video. Oh, there's a graphical interface to its Rande? Yeah. <laughs> I never knew. Yeah, and a message from the video operation team. If you do such stuff, they really like it if you know your X Rande. Sorry about the wait. Uh. So, um, I'm going to talk about my hat. Uh, actually, I want, I want to talk about this, which is a... It's, it is called Internet Cube, and it is, like, a great thing. Uh, my... Oh, can I...? Yes. That's better. Uh, my, first, my first concern was... Um, I didn't trust, I didn't really trust my... Uh, if, if you use a handheld microphone, yeah. please put, put your thumb up. Yeah. Put your thumb up. Like this? Yeah, yeah. And, and put it right here. Oh, yeah, I'm a true MC. Now you have the right distance. You can move everywhere. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> noise. My first concern was uh, I, don't, I don't trust my, my ISP, and he knows everything I'm doing on the Internet when I'm connecting to it. So. This cube solves a bit of that problem because by plugging it to the, the, my ISP router, I, I was able to encrypt actually all the, the connections uh, that were made. So it hides what I'm doing on my internet connection from my commercial ISP. Uh, that's the first part, uh, which is already quite awesome. Uh, the, th the second one is what I really wanted to show is that and there is, on my hat, the same thing. Uh, there is a server uh, running on that thing. And you can plug it anywhere, and it gives you uh, access to your data, to your website, and to, uh, well, pretty much what you want uh, on, on the domain name you choose. So I'm going to connect to it uh, on a very exciting domain name, I guess. That, that, that's me, because I'm, I'm, I'm very expert. Uh, well, I hope it will work, so I, I, uh, I'm, not, I'm not receiving well. Huh. Because the server is actually on my hat, so very expert is my hat. And obviously it doesn't work. That's, that ruins everything. Huh. I'll be right back. <laughs> you have two and a half minutes left. It's enough time to fix okay, it. Okay, okay. okay, the thing is, uh, I, <laughs> I did not have internet connection yet. You, you told me before, but I, I forgot. So, uh, my heart is broadcasting a Wi Fi network which is called Be Excellent to this hotspot. And by connecting to it with a really strong password, I guess. Yeah, um, yeah <laughs> very, very expert in network, right? Um, we are uh, <laughs> not, not Fry Funk. What the fuck? Fry Funk, get up. No. 
Okay. But <laughs> ah, Freifunk. <laughs> Damn it. Well, they are friends, but you know, they are broadcasting everywhere. Yes, it works now. <laughs> so I'm, I'm connected to my hat, but I'm just connected to a random, uh, a random access point here at this point. Is it plugged? Like. Yes, the network is active. Ah. So. I am active. So it's a 404 head not found? <laughs> mm. <laughs> it looks like it, but it, it looks like a, a, a hat timeout so far. Um, hmm. It's not good. Wanted to amaze you, but obviously it doesn't work. Hmm, let's ping uh, Google, which is a, always a good thing, right? Okay, <laughs> and it's gone. <laughs> okay, so uh, let's connect to a true network. Noise. What the fuck? <laughs> well, I'm sorry, obviously. Oh. I, you, I'm the last. Oh, yeah, great. So. You can ask for an extension. Yeah, oh, I, I will. <laughs> It's a live demo, I know it's hard. <laughs> but you do not do this because it's easy. No, it should be. We're at the last lightning talk, so we can bear with you a few minutes longer. Yeah. <laughs> oh, my hardware friend oh. is, uh, oh. is coming. <laughs> oh. So, I will, I will talk to you about the, the second part, even though I, uh, I cannot access to it. Uh, my hat is containing all my data, which in a way is a good thing that it doesn't open to the internet, right? Um, and uh, so I have my emails on it. I have a very cool very.expert website, which, is, uh, which should be accessible at some point. And uh, I, uh, I can yeah, receive emails in whatever at very.expert. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that was the second part. Now, you may wonder how we did uh, what we did in uh, how we did like a true plug and play server that you can bring home and just plug and you have your data on it. And uh, when my friend is fixing the network, I, I can talk to you about, about that a bit more. So, the Internet Cube is uh, a, uh, how to say it? is a bundle of three things. Uh, a hardware part, with, which is like a small Raspberry Pi on a box with an, a Wi-Fi antenna. Uh, a software part, which is basically Debian with uh, free softwares installed in it uh, to handle internet services, like your emails. And uh, your emails and your, uh, uh, and your, your files and uh, serving all that to the internet. And a network part, a network part, sorry, which is uh, uh, hand handled by uh, local uh, non-profit ISPs, uh, which I'm part of, and uh, which the Federation FDN is uh, is about. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Although you probably don't know what uh, F FFDN is, but we have a stand over there. We, we can explain. The thing is, uh, we are non-profit. Uh, ISPs and we uh, we are uh, yeah and we are <laughs> uh, providing uh, neutral and uh, yeah neutral internet accesses and uh, the the thing about local is that you can probably trust more uh, your local ISP which you can which with uh, with whom you can uh, bring beers and and hang out than your commercial one and uh, yeah that's about it but you wanted to say something maybe. Your five minutes are up. Yeah, I'm five minutes. Well, 
I tried a demo because very expert was a great site that I made. But, <laughs> but you will have a chance at the Congress, definitely. Nah. We will reserve a slot for you. Oh, that, that's kind. Thank right. you. Okay. You will you will want to try it? Oh it works. Oh yeah it works. Do you want to see it? Okay. Come on internet. Come on. This is the longest lightning talk of yeah, this camp. So, I'm so sorry. Um, very expert. Should have prepared a, a GIF at some point to dance for me. Maybe you can try very expert on your Okay. Yeah, 10 seconds, all right. Okay, I actually give you two more minutes. Oh, that's okay. Okay? Okay. <laughs> Did you try? Uh... Didn't work. Did not work? No, sorry. <laughs> I do, on the other hand, have your slides in case you want to show them. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, we can definitely show the slides uh, in, in the meantime. Do uh, you have them on there, or shall I... Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, yeah, there's basically uh, contact information, and, but not much about how it works. But, yeah, please, uh, please do. Oh, you, you want to? Okay. And it's gone. What? Is that that? So you have 55 seconds left. There are your slides. <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't watch it. Uh, so the slides, uh, yeah, you can go right to the, the end, I guess, uh, because, uh, oh yeah, this is, uh, this is the uh, website where you can uh, consult information about uh, what uh, the, the, the box is. Uh, and uh, obviously you can uh, just ask questions at the end of the, the talk or at the FFDN stand, which is just uh, a street over there. Uh, and I guess there is one more, no? Oh, no, that's the last one. And there is a mailing list, I, I would say. Uh, no, a IRC channel uh, in which you can uh, connect. What's about the network? We have like 10 seconds. Uh, Not working. Well, so, just thank try you very to much. go to very, very dot expert. At some point, it should work. When we, we, when we go back to the, to the camp, so thank you anyway. Thank you very much. And uh, with this, we conclu conclude today's lightning talks and also the lightning talks for this camp. Thank you very much for attending. And if you want to give a lightning talk at the Congress, please do so. Please tell us about your project or what you're doing in politics or any other thing that you want to have your five minutes of fame about at the Chaos Communication Congress in Hamburg. Thank you. Yes, those were the lightning talks for this camp. So we, I hope we all will see you again at the Congress. And uh, it was a pleasure to work with those guys who prepared the lightning talks, who did all the organizing, who did all the announcing, and also all the people behind the scenes on the video, on the microphone angels, the people in the translation box. So I think uh, it is more than appropriate to give them a big round of applause for this marvelous work.